clear in our expectations of that. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's <coughs> questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. <coughs> Presiding Officer, following the launch of the East Africa Crisis Appeal by the Disasters Emergency Committee yesterday, we're announcing today that the Scottish Government will donate £200,000 to the appeal. These funds will support agencies to provide vital supplies of food, water and medical treatment to those affected by the famine in South Sudan that was declared by the United Nations on the 20th of February. Uh, and later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. On behalf of my party and myself, I thank the First Minister for that answer and welcome uh, the contribution that the Scottish Government is making. And to ask the First Minister how she can divert this country into another unwanted, divisive referendum when she can't sort out issues in our local schools. First Minister. Well, of course, I and, I and the Education Secretary work to raise standards and close the attainment gap in our schools each and every single day, and that will continue to be our priority. But turning to wider issues, uh, the reality here is quite simple. I want to give people in Scotland a choice over their own future. We know that change is coming. The EU referendum last year made that change inevitable. We know that the Tories want to lead us off a hard Brexit cliff edge. I think the people of Scotland should not simply have to accept being told what their future should be by a Conservative government that we don't support. Instead, we should have the choice to choose a better future, and that's a choice I intend to give to the people of Scotland. Ruth Davidson. I thank the First Minister for her answer to my question, but I wonder if it would have been delivered with quite the same tone had she known that the question I put wasn't actually mine. It was a question that was put to one of my MSPs earlier this week by a parent who contacted our office. A parent at Deputy First Minister John Swinney's local high school in Blair Gowrie, who, like all parents there, received a letter from the school head earlier this week to see if a relative could fill in to teach maths because of a lack of cover, and who was furious to see Shameful. Furious to see on the very same day the First Minister of Scotland standing in Butte House, putting her job to one side and threatening to take Scotland back to another divisive referendum on independence. When the First Minister meets parents who are frustrated with the decline in standards in schools, how does she explain to them that another referendum will help their child? Let me firstly... First let me... Firstly, address the situation in Blue Gowrie High School. Uh, there are, as uh, the Education Secretary has said many times in this chamber uh, and out with it, a number of different parts of the country in specific subjects where there are challenges right now with teacher recruitment. That's why we have increased the intake of students to initial teacher education. It's why we have expanded the range of routes into teaching to make the process faster for these individuals. Um, and, you know, what uh, the situation at Burgowrie High School is, is seeking to identify teachers that are properly registered teachers to come in and teach uh, maths there. And, of course, the law says uh, that teachers have to be properly registered. So we will continue to address the challenges in our education system, as we will continue to address the challenges that exist, whether it's in health, education or any other area. And it's because the people of Scotland see us addressing these challenges that they continue to have confidence in this government to run this country. But on, the wider, but on the wider issue again, you, you know, I see it as part of my job to protect Scotland's interests. I see it as part of my job to protect Scotland from the prospect of a hard Tory Brexit. You know, the reality here is this. Ruth Davidson knows that Brexit is going to be a disaster. How do we know that? Because she told us that Brexit was going to be a disaster. But now Ruth Davidson tells us that we've simply got to accept Brexit, not just Brexit, but hard Brexit, regardless of the consequences. And we had the site yesterday of David Davis saying that they haven't even bothered to do an analysis of the costs of a hard Brexit. Well, luckily, analyses have been done by others. And we know that the path that the Tories are trying to take this country down could cost every household in this country more than £5,000. So in answer to 
Ruth Davidson's questions about the impact on young people in our country. The impact of Brexit on everybody in our country is going to be disastrous and that's why I have a duty to allow people the choice to opt for something better. Ruth Davidson. The truth is a referendum won't help pupils in Scotland and it won't help patients come off waiting lists and it won't help solve the GP crisis and it won't cut violent crime. It will just take this government away from the day job which is supposed That's to right. be its focus. And can I tell the First Minister something else that parents are asking? How is independence going to help my school? This morning we read that an independent Scotland would be a living billion pounds in the red and would need higher taxes, lower spending and increased borrowing just to fill the gap. The same warnings were given before 2014, the same warnings that this First Minister chose to ignore. So is it her policy once again to ignore the evidence and carry on regardless? First Minister. Well, you know, Scotland has a deficit like the UK has a deficit. Let me say this, that is a deficit created on Westminster's watch and it's about time we had the tools and the ability to work our way out of deficits that Tory and Labour governments have created in Scotland. But let's look, let's look at the alternative to independence. More Tory austerity. Tory austerity extending well into the next decade. Cuts to Scotland's budget by the Tories by the end of this decade will be 10% in real terms. Yesterday, Ruth Davidson talks about the day job. Yesterday, we saw the biggest U-turn from the Tories in decades, blowing a £2 billion hole in their budget. And because of Brexit, every household in this country could be facing a bill of £5,000. So I think Scotland deserves a choice, and that choice is this. Take control of our own finances to build, grow and innovate our way to a better future or allow Tories to continue to make the same mistakes over and over again and make the situation worse. Presiding officer, the First Minister chose earlier this week not to come before this Parliament to spell out her views right. on a referendum. Well, I choose to put this Parliament first. The Scottish Conservatives... <laughs> the Scottish Conservatives reject the proposal set out by the First Minister on Monday. A referendum cannot happen when the people of Scotland have not been given the opportunity to see how our new relationship with the European Union is working. And it should not take place when there is no clear political or public consent for it to happen. Our country does not want to go back to the divisions and uncertainty of the last few years. Another referendum campaign will not solve the challenges that this country will face. We don't want it, we don't need it. Why won't she listen? First Minister. Well, I was elected as First Minister less than enough, a year please. ago. Order. They don't want Order. to hear this. I was elected as First Minister a year ago with the highest constituency share of the vote in the history of devolution on a manifesto commitment that said this Parliament should have the right to hold another referendum if the Tories tried to drag us out of Europe against our will. That 46% share of the vote is 10 percentage points higher than the 36% share that the Tories used to have the EU referendum in the first place. And we hear from the Electoral Commission this morning that the vote share they may have got in the 2015 election was rather dodgy. But this Parliament, this Parliament has an independence majority in it as well. So Ruth Davidson says she wants to put this parliament first. Well, let me issue this direct challenge to Ruth Davidson and to the Conservative Party. If on Wednesday next week, this parliament votes for an independence referendum to give the people of Scotland a choice over their own future. Will the Conservatives respect the will of this parliament or are the Conservatives running scared?
Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week? First Minister. Uh, engagement to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Andrew Wilson is responsible for rebuilding the SNP's battered economic case for leaving the United Kingdom. This week it was reported that he told Nicola Sturgeon it could take up to 10 years for Scotland's economy to recover if we leave the UK. Does the First Minister think a lost decade is a price worth paying to drag Scotland out of the United Kingdom? First Minister. Well, the, reports, the reports appeared that appeared this week about the work of the Growth Commission were 100 per cent wrong, plain and simple. Andrew Wilson himself has said that. Uh, on the contrary to what was reported, the work of the Growth Commission is looking at how we get from the position we are in right now, saddled with a deficit created by Labour and Conservative governments down the generations, to a stronger and more sustainable future. And the question, I think, for Kezia Dugdale is this. Is she happy to see Scotland locked in to Tory austerity, not just for the rest of this decade, but into the next decade as well? Is she happy to see Scotland at the mercy of Tory cut after Tory cut after Tory cut? Or this time, is she going to stand up for the right of this country to choose a better future for itself? President Officer, the First Minister is so confident of the contents of that Growth Commission, she should publish it. But of course, we have been here before. SNP ministers assert one thing in public and admit another in private. We all remember, we all remember John Swinney's leaked paper which warned of cuts to public services and to our pensions. And now we have Andrew Wilson. And now we have Andrew Wilson, who has revealed in private what Nicola Sturgeon refuses to admit publicly, that leaving the UK would be devastating for Scotland's economy. It would mean even more cuts to schools and hospitals and cuts to those most in need. The First Minister said this week she didn't want a fact-free debate. So let's start with one fact she can't deny. Isn't it the case that, according to her own government statistics, leaving the UK would mean £15 billion worth of extra cuts? First Minister. Well, the band is well and truly back together, isn't it? Tory and Labour combining again to talk this country down. Here's the reality. Scotland has a deficit created on Westminster's watch and we have to deal with that deficit whether we are independent or not. Isn't it much better to have the tools and the powers of independence to deal with that deficit consistent with our own values and not Tory values? We face, if we are not independent, years and years and years of Tory austerity. I don't want that for my country and I think it is shameful that Labour now back that for this country. But you know, Labour is just all over the place on this. They cannot even get their own story straight. We've got Kezia Dugdale telling us that Labour will vote against another referendum. Jeremy Corbyn comes and tells us that UK Labour will not vote against another referendum. No wonder Labour's new slogan is, we're divided enough. Kezia Dugdale. President officer, this matters because it's about the money we have to spend on our public services. And the First Minister used to say that education was the defining priority of her government. Ah, yes. Now even she laughs when journalists ask her if yeah. that is still the case. The reality is that this government will once again grind to a halt for years. Yes. Closing the attainment gap, that's not the priority anymore. Oh. Fixing the mess she made of the NHS on the back burner. Investing in the care of the elderly, well, that can wait too. Can the First Minister tell us this? Does she plan to spend the next few years leading a government or a campaign? First Minister. 
Well, I'll continue as First Minister to lead a government that is focused on making sure we're raising standards in our schools, continuing to prove the National Health Service. But do you know what? All of these things get more difficult if we are subjected year after year to Tory cuts, Tory cuts that are going to be made worse by the hard Brexit that the Tories are pursuing and Labour seem willing to support. It is absolutely shameful that instead of standing up for Scotland, Labour simply supports the Conservatives and whatever they want to do. I want this country to take charge of our own future so that we can build a better country than Labour and the Tories have managed to do. So when people have a choice, as I am determined that they will have, a choice to say what kind of future they want, I'll be arguing for this country to be in charge of our own finances, in charge of our own future, in charge of building a fairer society and a stronger economy. Kezia Dugdale will be on the side of Ruth Davidson and Theresa May yet again, and her party will continue to die as a result. Thank you. We've got uh, three constituency questions. First of all, Tavish Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that NHS Shetland have decided that Shetlanders with medical appointments in Aberdeen must now use the 14-hour overnight ferry service rather than a 45-minute flight south. This policy will mean two days away from home and work for Shetlanders. There has been no consultation. The Managing Director of Logan Air tells me there has been no formal negotiation with the NHS to reduce flight costs and therefore make savings. NHS Shetland said last night they could consider closing GP surgeries or the maternity unit in Lerwick. If I said, suggested such a course of action, the First Minister would accuse me of scaremongering. Can I therefore ask the First Minister to tell her appointed board to reverse this decision until there have been commercial negotiations with Logan Air, a public consultation and a full understanding of what any change to, to the existing travels policy would mean from islanders from Unst to Fair Isle? First Minister. NHS Shetland has already provided assurance that decisions regarding travel arrangements will continue to be clinically led and patients for whom ferry transport is not suitable will continue to be offered air travel. It is vital that the board ensures that it continues to provide high quality direct patient care for the people of Shetland and we will continue to work with them uh, to reduce the number of patients who need to travel at all for appointments or treatment, uh, for example by expanding uh, the use of video consultations uh, on Shetland. Uh, but I will ensure that the comments that Tavish Scott has made in the Chamber today are conveyed uh, to NHS Highland and I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy uh, to meet uh, with him to discuss these issues in more detail. Neil Findlay. As politicians get all flustered about constitutional politics, back in the real world, 400 workers face losing their jobs at Ethicon and Livingston as Johnson & Johnson threatened to close a plant that's been profitable for three decades. Will the First Minister agree to meet with me and representatives from Unite the Union who represent the workforce so that we can all see what we can do to retain jobs at Livingston? First Minister. Uh, well, of course, we'll always be uh, more than happy to meet with uh, unions and representatives of the workforce. And I can tell the member uh, that we are already engaging uh, with Johnson & Johnson. Both myself and the Economy Secretary have engaged directly with the company, as have our enterprise agencies. And we are exploring every possible support for the site. The work that has been done so far has been detailed and intensive, looking at what we can do both to help address immediate business challenges and to maximise the site's future potential. So we will continue uh, with that engagement, continue to give uh, as much support as we can to the workforce. And as I said uh, at the outset, of course, we would be happy to meet with representatives of the workforce at any time. And Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister. <laughs> Liz Smith. First Minister, in light of the uh, recent traffic incidents on the fourth road bridge, and the serious effect that this has had on residents and businesses in Mid-Scotland and Fife and in the Lothians, will the Scottish Government undertake to have urgent talks with Transport Scotland to put in place additional measures besides those tougher penalties that are being imposed by the police on the offending drivers so that more is done in the first instance to prevent the blatant disregard of traffic restrictions? First Minister. Well, I mean, this was another uh, very regrettable incident uh, on the Fourth Road Bridge. A multi-agency response was very quickly put in place to 
respond to the closure and it worked effectively to manage the associated travel impacts and to get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible and let me thank everybody who worked hard to make sure that that happened. Uh, I can tell the Chamber today that Transport Scotland will shortly host a stakeholder conference to discuss what more can be done to prevent these incidents and this will include uh, the Traffic Commissioner, Police Scotland, the Fourth Bridge Operating Company, local authorities and industry representatives from the freight sector. Uh, we're also of course committed to the largest road investment investment programme uh, ever, including the 1.35 billion Queen's Ferry Crossing project. Uh, and as part of that investment, wind shielding is being fitted during the project to mitigate any wind-related closures on the new bridge. However, uh, in terms of the existing bridge, it is important that we continue to explore uh, what we uh, can do uh, to avoid people flouting uh, the advice and uh, resulting in closures uh, that should be completely avoidable. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Is it possible that an independent Scotland could not only be outside the United Kingdom single market, but also outside the European single market too? First Minister. Uh, no, I want uh, Scotland to be in the European Union. I want Scotland to be in the single market. Um, and that's why I think it's important to give people in Scotland that choice. What we know right now, though, beyond any doubt, is that if Scotland doesn't become independent, we are not only out of the EU, but we will be out of the single market as well. Uh, by considering independence, of course, we give ourselves the ability to secure a relationship with Europe and, of course, to secure the jobs the investment and the collaborations that depend on that. That is why giving people in Scotland the choice is so important. Yeah. Willie Rennie. The First Minister dodged the question. It was a simple question. Could we be out of both single markets? And the answer is yes. And the reason is this. It is just as difficult to get into the European single market as full EU membership. All, all 27 EU members would need to agree. And we heard from the Spanish government again yesterday. So her route guarantees nothing. It's exactly the same hurdle. That's why the First Minister's plans could leave us outside of the UK and the EU single markets. If she thought a Conservative hard Brexit was going to be damaging, just wait for this. It is absurd to use the EU as an excuse for another referendum when there is no guarantee that Scotland could get back into the EU. She is sucking up to the Eurosceptics on her own side while cynically selling out the pro-Europeans on the sly. Why can't she just admit that? First Minister. Well, of course, Willie Rennie spends most of his time sucking up to the Tories, so I'll take no lessons <laughs> from him. You know, I, I really can't believe the brass neck with which Willie Rennie has just asked that question. Because remember, Willie Rennie is one of the politicians, Ruth Davidson's another one, Kezia Dugdale is another one, that in 2014 looked the people of Scotland in the eye and said, if you vote no in the referendum, your membership of the European Union is secure. And if you vote yes, Scotland will not be allowed in. And two and a half years later, where this unionist alliance has contrived to make sure we are facing being taken out of the European Union against our will, they have the absolute temerity to stand up again and try to scaremonger that it's independence that's putting our EU membership at risk. It is absolutely breathtaking in its hypocrisy. And I'll tell you this, the people of Scotland will simply not fall for it again. Willie Rennie. We know from the First Minister that the more she blusters, the more she hides the truth. So I'll answer the, I ask the question again. Will Scotland be guaranteed to be a full membership member of the European Union or not? Can she guarantee that? If she can't, it's all bluster just again. First Minister. 
Independence gives us the ability to be in the EU to secure a relationship with Europe. Not being independent guarantees that we are out of the EU and out of the single market. But you know, Willie Rennie, who I have to say I think has a PhD in bluster, has a position here that is completely incoherent. Willie Rennie wants there to be a second referendum across the UK to give the people of the whole UK a choice, even though he knows there is not a chance of that happening. But yet here in Scotland, yeah. where uh, there is the opportunity for people to have a choice, Willie Rennie is completely opposed to that. According to Willie Rennie, we've just got to accept Tory hard Brexit come what may. Well, I think it's about time people in Scotland had a choice so that we can take the future of our own country into our own hands. Supplementary from James Dornan. Uh, would the First Minister tell us if, uh, whether discussions were held with the Treasury ahead of their planned national insurance tax hike or at the point when they realised they'd broken their manifesto promise or before they decided to U-turn or even after yesterday's embarrassing climb down given the impact this would have on many self-employed people across Scotland? First Minister. I know there were no discussions with the Treasury um, either about the original policy or about their uh, embarrassing uh, U-turn yesterday. Uh, the Tories are in complete and utter chaos. Uh, you know, we've had lectures, have we not, week after week after week from the Tories here about tax, and yet it was a Tory government that was going to hike taxes up on self-employed people and then, of course, in a screeching U-turn, uh, change their minds. So we'll go on with doing our best to deliver for the people of Scotland uh, while the Tories continue to descend into utter chaos. Andy Whitewin. Uh, this week I, I learned in response to a written answer that of 120 secondments into the Scottish Government, almost universally from other bodies in the public sector, the Association of Salmon Fishery Boards uh, were seconded. This comes on the back of a previous question revealing that the Director of Policy of the National Farmer Union of Scotland has been embedded within the Scottish Government since November 2016. Three days a week he works lobbying the Scottish Government on behalf of his organisation and two days he works at the heart of government developing uh, policy. Does the First Minister believe that this is a healthy development? Will she explain what exactly the purpose of these representatives of the landed class is at the heart of government? And does she agree with me that there's an obvious conflict of interest? First Minister. Uh, no, no, I don't because, well, I think it is right. Well, I actually think it's right. I know it's not fashionable to... Uh, consider the views of experts has been worth listening to these days but I think it's right that in government we do have expertise from a range of different areas helping to inform and develop government policy uh, and we do that from a range uh, of different interests so that there is a, a broad spectrum of expertise feeding into government policy so uh, I'm happy to correspond with Andy Whiteman if he's got particular concerns uh, around uh, this but in general uh, governments uh, using the expertise that exists across our country I think is a good thing that should be welcomed. Rona Mackay. To ask the First Minister how people will be given the opportunity to shape Scotland's new social security system. First Minister. Well, key to the design of our social security system, uh, as we have said, is working alongside people who have themselves got direct personal experience of the current social security system. We want to hear directly from them about what works, what needs improved and what our new system can do to better support them. Uh, and of course from today people across Scotland will begin to receive letters inviting them to, enjoy, to join the experience panels which will shape our new social security system. The invitations have been sent to 18,000 people who have recent or current experience of the system. Uh, so I hope people will take the time to look at the invitation uh, to join the panels and will take the opportunity to be part of building a new social security system in Scotland which will have fairness, dignity and respect at its heart, all principles missing from the social security system currently under Westminster's control. And this time question four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what guidance the Scottish Government has issued regarding use of the Pupil Equity Fund. First Minister. On the 1st of February, the Deputy First Minister announced the Pupil Equity Funding at school level allocations for 2017-18. Draft national operational guidance was published on the same day and issued to local authorities and uh, direct to schools. 
The guidance sets out clear principles to support schools and local authorities uh, to work in partnership and plan how to effectively invest the additional £120 million to raise attainment and close the attainment gap. Uh, I have been absolutely clear, as has the Deputy First Minister, that this funding must be used at the discretion of head teachers. It must be additional to existing provision and it cannot be top sliced for other purposes. It must be used to improve the educational outcomes of children most affected by poverty. Claire Adamson. The First Minister will be aware of reports that North Lanarkshire Council has proposed that head teachers return a considerable proportion of the Pupil Equity Fund to the General Education Fund. The Pupil Equity Fund is intended to go directly to head teachers for the most deprived children in Scotland to help address the attainment gap. Does the First Minister share my concerns that this is an abhorrent proposal from a Labour yeah, Council? Yes, yeah. First Minister. Um, I, I am indeed aware of the issues raised in relation to North Lanarkshire's pupil equity funding and I am particularly disappointed that the uh, Labour Council has chosen to cut classroom assistance making that decision on the 23rd of February despite the options open to them to avoid this. The expectation that head teachers should then subsidise this cut with their pupil equity funding is simply unacceptable. Uh, these issues have been raised with the Council and discussions are continuing and I very much hope that the Council will reconsider its approach. Uh, and I do think it's really important to be very clear. Uh, we in the Scottish Government will only release this funding if the Council agrees that it goes to the schools as intended and that it's not used by them to pay for existing resources. Anything else would, quite frankly, be a betrayal of the disadvantaged children of North Lanarkshire. Ian Gray. <clears throat> Presiding officer, North Lanarkshire Council is facing a £27 million cut to their poor budget. They are trying, they are trying to protect and enhance the jobs of over 200 classroom assistants exactly to raise attainment and close the gap. They are supported by the EIS, by Unison and by their head teachers, 77 of whom have written to the Deputy First Minister uh, in that, uh, in, in that, to say that. In response, the Scottish Government is threatening to cut almost £9 million more from their budget. Can the First Minister explain how this politically motivated blackmail is supposed to help school children in North Lanarkshire. First Minister. Well, Ian Gray, Ian Gray interestingly omitted to tell us something else that North Lanarkshire Council is choosing to do. It's choosing to freeze its council tax yeah. next year. So much money. So clearly, having asked us for the ability to put the council tax up, they decide they don't need that money. Instead, they're going to try to pilfer resources from the pupil equity fund. Now, this parliament was very clear that the pupil equity funding, 120 million pounds of it, was money to go direct to schools to be used at the discretion of head teachers. And Ian Gray tells us uh, that apparently there are people who support the approach of the council. Uh, the Association of Directors of Education, as I understand it, do not support the approach of the Council. So this is quite simple. This is money that we want to give direct to head teachers, direct to schools, but North Lanarkshire Council wants to use it for something else. So we are determined this money is going direct to schools. And I think it's utterly shameful that Labour are defending an approach that would see that money used by North Lanarkshire to fund things that it is their responsibility to fund. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I ask the First Minister, in light of this controversy, what measures will be put in place to assess if the key principles behind the Pupil Equity Fund, namely that head teachers will have access to the full amount and that the spending must be on additional activities to those currently employed, will be adhered to? First Minister. 
is what the guidance that I referred to in my first answer is there to ensure, that there are clear principles uh, guiding how this money is used and that we are then able uh, to monitor and assess the benefits of this money. Let's get back to the core issue here. You know, week after week, absolutely rightly and understandably, uh, members of the opposition uh, come to this chamber, and I've got no complaint about this, and raise uh, the issue of the attainment gap. I have said repeatedly, closing that gap is my priority. That is why we have set up a pupil equity fund of £120 million that is being directed to schools to help particularly young people living in disadvantaged circumstances. That's what this is all about. And that is why it is so deeply concerning that we have a local authority that sees the opportunity just to cut something in its budget uh, and substitute that cut with money from the pupil equity funding. That's not what it's for. That's not what it's about. And if that approach is allowed to continue, then frankly, that is a betrayal of the most disadvantaged pupils in North Lanarkshire that are meant to benefit from this fund. And as First Minister, I'm not prepared to allow that to happen. Yes. Question number five, Annie Wills. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle gun crime. First Minister. Uh, the number of recorded crimes and offences in Scotland involving firearms has fallen by nearly three quarters in 10 years, and firearms crimes where a person was killed or injured fell by over 25% between 2014-15 and 15-16. Uh, the Scottish Government has taken action. We have some of the strongest firearms legislation in the world and have strengthened this further with our new air weapons licensing regime. Uh, Police Scotland is committed to tackling gun crime and clear up rates for these offences remain high. But there is absolutely no room for any complacency. Recent incidents show that we must keep this situation under review and continue to address gun crime wherever it occurs in our communities. Annie Wills. I thank the First Minister for her answer. This will unfortunately come of little consolation to the people of Glasgow, a city which has seen five separate incidents of serious gun crime in the past 12 months alone. And we know that between 2014-15 and 2015-16, Case of attempted murder or serious assaults increased in Scotland by 27%. And we know that despite these being mostly targeted attacks, these crimes are taking place on the streets, with one in particular in Glasgow happening outside a primary school. What conversation will the First Minister now have with Police Scotland to ensure that these crimes do not take place in our streets and innocent bystanders are not put at risk? First Minister. Well, I mean, these are really important issues and just uh, let me be clear, both I and the Justice Secretary periodically uh, are updated and briefed by the police on some of the uh, types of incident that she is uh, referring to and updated on the work the police is doing uh, to try to uh, combat these kinds of offences. I think it's important to reiterate uh, that gun crime generally uh, is falling, uh, falling, as I said, by nearly three quarters in the last 10 uh, years. And of course, crimes uh, where a person was killed uh, or injured by a firearm uh, fell by 25% between 14-15 and 15-16. But the incidents that uh, Annie Wells refers to in uh, Glasgow, part of the country, of course, that I uh, represent are deeply concerning. One of the incidents uh, was indeed in my uh, own uh, constituency. Uh, these, uh, according to the police, uh, are targeted incidents linked to serious and organised uh, crime. Um, and that makes it very important that the police continue to use uh, the resources and the intelligence they have uh, to properly deal with these uh, offences and bring to justice those who are uh, responsible. So these are important issues uh, that I and the Justice Secretary will continue uh, to be updated on by the police. But I don't think they should allow us uh, to be taken away from the fact that gun crime generally is falling. That's a good thing. We shouldn't be complacent, uh, but it is a good thing and it should give reassurance to communities all over the country. Question six, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will ensure that changes to unit assessments will not increase teacher workload in light of reports that 63% of teachers believe that they will. First Minister. The changes to the qualifications uh, were announced by the Deputy First Minister following discussions with the Assessment and National Qualifications Group and the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. Uh, the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, whose survey uh, is being referred to, is represented on both groups. 
Uh, the changes mean that teachers and young people will not have to undertake formal unit assessments during the year. Uh, this is what teachers and others uh, told us was significantly contributing to workload uh, and indeed the moves were welcomed by teaching unions last year. Uh, we continue to work with partners including the SQA, Education Scotland and teacher unions to ensure that workload is reduced as a result of these changes. Uh, the assessment and national qualifications group is in fact meeting uh, this afternoon and will continue to discuss uh, the implementation of the changes. Daniel Johnson. I would thank the First Minister for that answer. John Swinney came into his new job promising to slash teacher workload and burden. But this survey reveals that teachers think that the changes to unit assessment will increase, not decrease, the workload, and especially in science. Can I ask the First Minister what work and assessment has been made to make sure that these measures will have a positive impact on teacher workload? And can we, she reassure the Chamber that this will not lead to just yet another embarrassing backtrack and delay arising from ill thought through reforms from the Deputy First Minister? Well, First Minister. I, I'm not sure if Daniel Johnson listened to the, the first answer uh, I gave him. He would have found the answer to what he just asked me in uh, the, the answer that I gave him. Uh, firstly, the reforms that he talks about as being ill-judged and rushed were actually reforms that teacher unions wanted to see uh, in order to uh, play a part. They're not the only uh, change that has been made to reduce uh, teacher workload and unnecessary bureaucracy uh, that teachers have to deal with, but they are an important part of that. Uh, so that is the intention of them. Clearly, in doing that, it is important uh, that steps are taken to make sure that the integrity of the exam system is not undermined. Uh, but as I said uh, earlier on, in, in terms of the question about what are we doing, I referred to a meeting this very day of the Assessment and National Qualifications Group to make sure that the concerns uh, that have been shown in the survey that he refers to uh, do not materialise, that these changes uh, that have that intention uh, actually turn out to deliver that in reality. So we will continue to work with teachers and with others to make sure that is the case. And I would have thought Daniel Johnson would have welcomed that. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. The fact that this government has listened to teachers' concerns about workload is welcome, both for them and for children and young people. Can the First Minister advise what other measures are being taken to free up time for teachers to teach? First Minister. <clears throat> well, addressing the issue of workload, as I said uh, to Daniel Johnson, has been a priority uh, for the Deputy First Minister. Uh, Literally thousands of pages of guidance have already been stripped away uh, and a teacher panel was established to test proposals to reduce workload, proposals that go beyond the ones uh, that are the subject of this question. Uh, last year, every teacher in Scotland uh, was sent a clear and concise statement on Curriculum for Excellence, along with benchmark guidance on literacy and numeracy. And that definitive guidance makes it clear what teachers should and should not be required to do. So we are determined to take the actions that will free teachers from unnecessary bureaucracy and workload. We're determined to free them to do what they do best, which is to raise the bar for all and close the attainment gap in our schools. And Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. We've heard today from the SSTA that there is now a crisis in recruiting head teachers because of a workload. Would the First Minister agree with me that the Scottish Government's claim to be committed to reducing teachers and head teachers' workload is absolutely not happening, and that there is a real threat now that we will lack leadership in schools because people simply won't apply to become head teachers? First Minister. Uh, no, I. I don't agree with that. I, I fundamentally disagree with that. We have listened to teachers, uh, including head teachers, uh, and we are taking the steps, some of which I have outlined here today, uh, that will reduce unnecessary work, and I stress the word unnecessary workloads for teachers. Uh, and we're doing that in partnership with teachers. Uh, and I understand that as we go through that, we will hear uh, scepticism, as we have from the SSTA, about the effect that these changes will have. And it's our job to make sure these changes are implemented in a way uh, that they will have the desired effect. So we are listening, uh, we are introducing these changes. And as I've said in previous answers, we're getting on with implementing these changes so that we do make an appreciable difference uh, to the workload of teachers in our schools across the country. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Mike Rumbles. Uh, in um, the First Minister made it clear that it was important to listen to the will of Parliament. And last week, uh, the government lost a vote in Parliament. And the week before, it lost two votes in Parliament. And on those occasions, you said from the chair that these were non-binding votes. I would like your uh, 
to hear from you, uh, another ruling, presiding officer, whether the vote after the debate next week on Tuesday and Wednesday are also non-binding. Yes, motions of this Parliament are not binding, as the member knows. Uh, that's not a point of order. We'll move on to members' business. In the name of Ross Thompson, and we'll just take a few moments to change seats.